this was a learning experience for us. Okay, I have the thumbs up. So welcome everyone to the 2015 edition of the Science Internship Program at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, my name is Raja Guhatakurta. I founded this program in 2009 with three students, and I am its director this year. We have 104 students in the program. I'll talk more about the growth of this program. But as most of you know, the Science Internship Program, or SIP, is a program in which high school students take a deep dive into research in a science area, in a, in a subject that's in, in the realm of science, technology, engineering, or math. Before, you, before I tell you more about the program, I want to say a little bit about the people who bring this program to you. So if I could have the next slide, please, Alejandra, thanks. So there's a lot of names on this slide. I don't expect you to read all of them. I don't expect to be able to read out all of the names on this slide. But I want to say that it takes a large team of dedicated people to put together a program as complex and large as ours. At the core of this team is Sue Grasso, who's filled your mailboxes for months. She has been my right hand for the last year and a half. Nina Arnberg has been my left hand for the last six months. Together they make me ambidextrous, I guess. <laughs> Joanne, thank you, thank you. Uh, Joanne Yamaguma was Sue's predecessor, and she retired a couple of years ago. I have an asterisk next to her name, and I have an asterisk next to the names of people who helped in the early phase of the SIP program. Um, one of our recent additions is Emily Entress. Emily, where are you? Oh, there you are. Um, Emily is our partner liaison as we try to put together a global, as we are in the process of putting together a global network of STEM programs for high school students. Uh, that, you know, those partners from that network are exactly the people who are online listening in right now via this Google Hangout on Air. Now, if Sue, Nina, Joanne, and Emily are on lead vocals, we have a large team on keyboards, as you can imagine, for a program like this. We have a large team on keyboards. Um, the, our most prominent keyboard player is Bob Stillerman, who's not here today, but he has set up our amazing project and application management system. We have a team that set up our website. Atticus is part of that team. And then, very importantly, we have a team today led by Dee Feher at Google, who's uh, doing this on, you know, online from Oregon right now. Dee is leading a small but very capable team of people who are taking this kickoff event and broadcasting it live. Uh, Atticus is the uh, Atticus and Teresa are here from that team. Um, so is Jansen. Uh, they are responsible for taking this event and broadcasting it live. The SIP program at Santa Cruz involves finances, and we have um, a bunch of people who are involved in that. Um, you know, Sue and Nina are involved in everything. I, if I put their names down, it would start to look very boring. So I, I've left their names off many of these lists, but they're, they're involved in every piece of it. But we have a group specifically looking after finances. We have um, a very capable team looking at lab safety and field work safety, because your children are minors, parents, your children are minors. The students, uh, the interns of this program are, are under 18, so there are specific restrictions we have to follow. We have a risk mitigation team, again, looking at ways to keep the program safe, keep the minors safe, keep the mentors safe, keep the labs from blowing up. We have a team of people, no, I'm just saying that to scare you. Um, we have a team of people looking after housing. Campus housing is an option. It's not something every student avails of, but it uh, takes a team to make that work. And we have four RAs, resident, residential assistants, from that program here. Uh, Catherine Mayorga, Victor Papoka, Alejandra Fuentes, and Cooper Smith. Can you please uh, put up your hand or stand, if you please? Um, so they will, be, uh, they will be the four RAs. They're UCSC undergraduates who are trained to be RAs, and they'll be looking after your students in campus housing. 
We'll run workshops for interns. We've run a workshop for mentors already. We'll run workshops for interns again this summer. Uh, we have folks who assign office space. We have a parent from the SIP program, Inkin Sparkman, who I believe isn't here today, but uh, she leads uh, a group who organize a shuttle that runs from the San Jose, Los Gatos area to UCSC and back. And then we have a, a very capable team of people who, help, who have helped us, who continue to help us with strategic planning and support, and, and their names are here as well. So before I go any further, I think this would be a great moment to give every one of these people a big round of applause. Thank you. Now, your biggest applause should be saved for the mentors who are the lifeblood of this program. The mentors are going to be on stage in just a minute, or in, in a few minutes. They'll be, they'll be speaking about their research. You'll see the exciting range of things they do. You'll see the enthusiasm. You'll see their passion for engaging young people in research. You'll see that. I don't have to say very much about it. The mentors are truly the lifeblood of this program. The mentors and the interns, many of whom are in the audience, together make this program what it is. So I also wanted to thank the parents for letting us, for letting your children spend their entire summer in Santa Cruz, away from other great things they could be doing, diving into research and making, making our program that much richer. Okay, so uh, I'll say a few things about the, the SIP program now, so if you could go to, go to the next slide, please. Uh, the emphasis in SIP is real STEM research projects. I've underlined and bolded, and I should have put it in italics and put it in a different font. Real, I couldn't emphasize that anymore. It's a simple word. But these projects are real. We are not asking our students to solve problems that other people have already solved. We're asking our students to work alongside their mentors on problems that nobody has solved yet. There's no guarantee that this problem will be solved in the 10 weeks that, you're, that the intern is working on this program. There's no guarantee that the problem will be solved in the 5 or 10 years that the mentor may be working on this program or has been working on this program. So these are truly open-ended problems. They're important problems. They're very important context. It's important for the students to understand that context. I'll get to that later. But these are real projects. And one of my colleagues at Stanford, Jill Helms, likes to say that we call it research, we don't call it search, because you don't find it the first time. You have to keep looking. And I can't emphasize how important this skill is of being able to get up from a stumble, get up quickly from a stumble, to learn from that stumble, rather than just learning how to run fast. The people who get the furthest in life are not those who run the fastest, the ones who get up the fastest from falls, because everyone's going to fall. Um, this program is symbiotic in nature, and you'll see in a minute why we have so many mentors in this program. It's because our interns truly end up helping the mentors with their research projects. It's wonderful for the interns. This is real-world research experience. This is, looks great on a college resume. It's the material for science competition papers. But it's helping somebody's real research program. And I want to emphasize that the SIP program is not an outreach program. An outreach, in an outreach program, a researcher goes out of their way to reach a student. In this case, the student is the one going out of their way to get in the path of the researcher. And that's a very, very important distinction between this program and many others out there. I'd like to say that our program stops looking like a program from today onwards. It's been looking like a program all this while. We've gathered together. We all seem like one big family and one program. But after the end of this kickoff event, the interns will go off with their research group, go to their labs, and start working pretty much independent of the other interns. That's another thing that's very unusual about this program. They're hardly, the interns are hardly ever together in classrooms. At the same time, we really value the interaction that goes on among the interns. They learn much more from one another. I hate to admit this. They learn much more from one another than from any of the mentors uh, in the program. That's just how it is. Um, we have a pretty packed event calendar in this, um, 
you know, this summer. It has field trips for optional field trips for some students. It has, um, for example, remote observing through a telescope for the astronomy students. It has workshops for interns, teaching them how to be better, even better researchers than they already are. It's about learning to read papers, learning to write papers, learning to give presentations, learning to navigate this very gray research environment where the answers are not sharply defined, but the problems, the questions are not sharply defined. So we have workshops that are designed to help students navigate that environment. Um, I want to say a few words about campus housing. Uh, this is an option. It's not an option for the first two weeks of the program, but it's an option for the remaining eight weeks, from weeks three through ten. Um, it's a wonderful experience for kids who take part in that. It gives you a, a, a teaches your kids how to do laundry, for example, um, which can't be a bad thing. Um, it gets them ready for college. It really gets them ready for college in ways that are non-academic. Um, I mentioned already that we have a shuttle, but half our students are signed up to use housing for some part of the time. The remaining students will be using the shuttle on a regular basis. But I guess very importantly, this program is about students working independently. Independently meaning they're not even um, working with their mentors a large part of the time. They will be shadowing their mentors for part of the time. It's like their mentor is walking and they're walking a few steps behind to watch their mentor to see where he or she stumbles and falls to learn from that. They'll be walking alongside their mentor for part of the time, not necessarily in the same space. They could be connected online, but they would be walking alongside their mentor in the sense that they're at the same stage of the understanding of the project. And believe me, there will be parts of the project where the intern will be leading a piece of the project, where the mentor will turn to the intern and say, uh, exactly where have you reached with this? What is your understanding of this? The intern will actually be ahead in certain parts. So we want that to happen. This program has been wildly successful by many measures. Uh, we've had success in the Siemens and Intel competitions. These are nationwide science competitions that um, typically three or four thousand students apply to every year. That's three or four thousand students from around the country who apply to these programs. That's many more than the number of students who actually engage in research. Only a subset of them actually submit to these competitions. The competition involves writing a 20-page paper with a bibliography, with figures. It's written like a scientific journal article. So it takes about a month and a half two months to work on these things. The writing of a paper is an internship in itself. I'm proud to say, I don't know what the numbers are going to be this year, but I'm proud to say in the last two years when our numbers of interns were in the 60s, we had about half our students submit papers to the Siemens competition. About half, more than half our students. So 42 out of 68 last year, 39 out of 61 the year before that. That's a remarkable achievement in itself. The fact that a project has reached the stage of maturity, the fact that the intern's understanding has reached the stage of, stage of maturity, that they can write a 20-page paper is remarkable in its own right. Many of these papers have placed in semifinals, regional finals, and even national finals. I'll give you one stat. We typically, our program for the last two years, accounts for one-third of California's Siemens semifinalists. One in 20 of the nation's semifinalists in the Siemens competition are from our program. So about 5% of the 5% of the nation. It's absolutely remarkable. Our numbers are growing, so I expect the percentage to increase. So no pressure, guys. Um, in a sense, submitting to this competition is a very high bar, but there are even higher bars that our interns have scaled in past years. A higher bar than the science competition is presenting to professional researchers in your field. We've had lots of students present at the American Astronomical Society meeting, where students will present posters as lead authors. High school students present posters as lead authors. I'm not kidding when I say the American Astronomical Society does not have a category for high school student entrance. They've started one thanks to us. They have I used to ask our students to put down undergraduate because they haven't yet graduated, and so, and that's how they would register. Um, when they show up at these conferences, many of our students can tell you this, they can, you can tell who they are, not because they're nervous, but because they're the best dressed of anyone in the, in the room. <laughs> parents, or not parents, researchers will come up to them, read their poster, talk to them about the poster, and ask them what year of graduate school they're in. This is a very typical occurrence. Um, 
an even higher bar. And the AAS meeting is not the only meeting. The AGU is another meeting. Thanks. Students end up as co-authors on journal articles. This is a very, very high bar. Um, students place in top colleges around the country, around the nation. And we have a high fraction of interns who return to the program. Spending 10 weeks in the summer seems like a long time, but they, we've had students return for a third summer, first, second, third summer. Um, so we like that. We have many interns returning. They'll talk about that. And we've had tremendous support from the program from many quarters. Next slide, please. This is just to give you a, an idea of the growth of the program. We started with three students in 2009, and we have 104 students this year. That's the breakdown by students from public versus private schools um, in those bar graphs. And the small table shows you the number of schools, 51 schools, represented in this year's program. Um, I do want to say that a, a uh, I, one thing I forgot to mention as one of the highlights of our science internship program is we require students to present something at the end of this program. We think that's a key part of this, communicating what they found. Even if they don't submit a science competition paper, we want them to present at the end of this program. So that's a key part of it. Uh, next slide, please. We're proud to say that 60% of our students are girls. And this is how it's been. From the only time this wasn't the case was in the first year of the program where we had two boys and one girl. Since then, <laughs> since then, girls have outnumbered boys by a factor of three to two. We are diverse in many ways. And in the off season, especially Sue, but later Nina and I, have worked really hard to make our program more diverse and to increase the, the inclusion in this program more than ever before. We've tried to be more diverse and inclusive in terms of ethnicities of our interns, in terms of the educational background of their parents, in terms of their socioeconomic status. We've tried to become more diverse in terms of the different research areas represented. There are 12 different research areas represented this year. We've tried to become more diverse in terms of the techniques used for that research. Now, Having said this, I am going to invite our mentors to gather onto stage to each speak for 30 seconds, because we, we're hoping we'll have as many as 50 mentors speak about who they are, what their name is, what their position is in the university, what their subject of research is, and what kind of what kind of thing has drawn them? What what has drawn them to the SIP program? In many cases, they're they're returning. Um, many cases, they're returning mentors. So I would like to have your our mentors start to gather, please. I'm, I, I forget who is ushering them on, but could could we get ready with that, please? Um, okay. So the mentors, please start. We're going to start with astronomy and astrophysics. Just so the mentors know, we're going to start with astronomy and astrophysics. Then we'll go to biomolecular engineering. Um, then we'll go to chemistry, biochemistry, and so on. I'll give you, I have the, the list. So I, I want to have the astronomy slides up. Um, so Martin, Drew, if you want to start coming up this way. Martin and Drew, come on up, please. Um, now, I'd like to say that I direct this program. However, I've also been a parent in this program. I've had a, a child be part of this program for a couple of years. And I've been a mentor in this program throughout. I'm going to be a mentor this year again. So I'm a professor of astronomy and astrophysics. I've been here for 21 years. And this year, I'll be a mentor on, on two different projects in astronomy involving a couple of graduate students and uh, one postdoc as primary mentors. So I'm going to hand you over to uh, Drew. So we're going to make this really quick fire. Come on. Hi, I'm Drew Phillips. And I work uh, in astronomy at U University of California Observatories. And mostly these days, mostly these days, I'm doing uh, instrumentation, and uh, so the projects this year involve uh, working with thin films for astronomical optics, and uh, I think it's an excellent opportunity for people to get their hands dirty. Okay, I'm Martin Gaskell. I'm. Oh, oh, I, uh, can you? 
is it is it on? No. Is it, okay, right. Okay, okay, okay. Um, I'm Martin Gaskell. I'm I'm from astronomy. Um, I don't do anything interesting. Um, I, I just work on supermassive black holes in the middle of galaxies, which are um, um, up to about a billion times the mass of our sun, and which will eat you if you get close to one. But it's not very interesting. Um, and and and, and I, I've um, I've had. Uh, lots of wonderful experiences that we're working working with with students of all sorts of ages and backgrounds and, and so on. So, okay. My name is Joel Pimack. Uh, I'm one of the main creators of the modern theory of how the universe works. Uh, it's called cold dark matter, and it was uh, largely created here at Santa Cruz by George Blumenthal, who's now the chancellor at UCSC, and Sandra Faber, who's a very distinguished astronomer, and me. Uh, this summer, uh, the students working with my group are going to work on galaxies and also on what we call the large-scale structure of the universe. Uh, there are two uh, senior people working with me, a graduate student, Christoph Lee, and a postdoc, Aldo Rodriguez, neither of whom seems to be here yet this morning. Uh, but anyway, uh, I hope that they've contacted the SIP students working with us to say that there's a meeting at 11 a.m. in the Center for Adaptive Optics conference room. So the students working with Aldo and Christoph and me, Joel Primack, please meet this morning at starting at 11 a.m. in the Center for Adaptive Optics conference room. Uh, I'll be here at the end of the meeting and I can show you where that is. Hello, I, I'm David Williams, and the uh, postdoc in my group, Jonathan Bateau, is going to be mentoring a project up, um, which is listed here as AST10, gamma ray cosmology with splines. So my group, like Martin's group, we study the supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies and study them in gamma rays. But in addition to studying these sources themselves, we can all, they're very bright gamma ray sources, and we can use them as sort of lighthouses illuminating the intervening material between the galaxies and us and the project that the mentors will be working on will be using gamma rays as probes of the amount of extragalactic background light in the intervening medium this summer. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Arjun, and I'm the only BME SIP mentor for this year. Hopefully there will be more next year. Uh, I'm a PhD student in David Hausler's lab uh, here at UCSC, and the question that I'm trying to answer is, you know how when you fall sick, within two days you sort of get a fever and then your immune system protects you from whatever was infecting you? Why doesn't that happen with cancer? The answer is that it does, but it's not very strong. So my research is looking into ways to make this immune response stronger, such that you don't have to go through chemotherapy and radiotherapy to cure a patient. Thank you. So we're going to switch next to chemistry and, and, and biochemistry, please. Um, and what you're seeing on the screen in a font that's almost certainly too small to read are titles of the projects and the names of the primary mentors only. We have not listed, just for the sake of space, we have not listed the names of the faculty supervisors of the primary mentors or of the secondary mentors who are also involved in this research. So I'll have Chris come on and talk about chemistry and biochemistry. Hi, my name's Chris. Um, we're from the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Um, specifically, actually, yeah, all four of us, we work with nanomaterials. And they're all basically geared towards energy research. So in my lab, we work with metal nanoparticles and basically change the core, the type of metal that the particle is made out of, and the capping ligand to uh, make better particles for electrocatalysis for fuel cell applications. And um, I, I love the SIP program. This is my fourth year doing it. And um, there's always really good results and good, uh, good student workers. So I'm glad to be back. OK, morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tian Yiko, and I'm from the chemistry and biochemistry department. Now my research project is focused on the supercapacitors, which will be the next generation energy storage device, and aiming to uh, replacing the traditional battery. And uh, okay, I heard about the 
the program from my friends, and he told me this is a fantastic program, and I like teaching, and I hope to discuss more ideas with my incoming students. And I, I also sincerely hope he can do more, uh, he can achieve more in this program. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tian Yu. I'm from Professor Yali's lab uh, from Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. And in this year, my project will be deal with uh, supercapacitors as well. And it is a kind of ele electrical charge storage device, uh, which is promising for using in the hybrid vehicles in next generation. So specifically, uh, this year, my project will be uh, working on the modification of carbon nanomaterials used for supercapacitors. Uh, we know this is a really long way to go, but we are working on it. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Pei Guanghu. I'm from uh, Shou Yichin lab in uh, chemistry and biochemistry lab uh, department. Um, I'm also working on uh, electrocatalyst for oxygen reduction reaction uh, used in a uh, few cell applications. And uh, I'm, I'm working to search for cheap and uh, uh, more efficient uh, catalyst, either metal or non-metal, to um, replace uh, the commonly used the platinum, uh, platinum uh, uh, catalyst, which is very expensive. And uh, I'm also, except this, I'm also working on uh, nano, uh, nanoparticle uh, electron delocalization within uh, a nanoparticle uh, within one nanoparticle uh, uh, kept by organic ligand, either by changing the uh, component of the metal core, I mean the nanoparticle core, or the capping ligand, you can monitor the for luminescence uh, change or the electro or the change in electrochemistry measurement. So uh, uh, this is my first time as a mentor in SIP. I hope I can uh, have a good time with my intern. Uh, working in in my lab. Thank you. So while we bring the while we bring the next group of um, the next set of subject mentors from the next set of subjects onto stage, um, if we could please go back a couple of slides, Alejandro. I just want to point out a couple of things about astronomy and um, just a, if you could go back just a couple of slides, please, uh, Alejandra. Uh, oh, it's on. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, this program started with only astronomy, but in its second year, 2010, there were chemistry mentors from the Xiaowei Chen and Yatli labs, and those two labs have been part of the SIP program ever since. So we see this again and again. Mentors get involved once, and they keep coming back to this program. This is true for the Hausler lab as well. I believe this is the third year that the Hausler lab has been involved in SIP, and the sixth year in, uh, in which the Chen and Li labs in chemistry, biochemistry have been involved in this. OK, let's go forward, please, to the computer science, computer engineering slides, and I'll have the, the mentors come on to stage. Sorry, this is cut off at the top. Um, go ahead, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Rakshita Agrawal, and I'm a PhD student in computer science here. So my project will be in crowdsourcing system for policy development and moderation. Uh, in my lab, my research is essentially dealing with crowdsourcing and its uh, both mathematical and design aspects. And I work both on developing and then studying the systems. In this project, I'll be working with my interns to actually design a system where the process of policy creation, as well as con continuously monitoring it, can be worked out through the help of crowds. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Larissa. I'm a first year PhD student in the computer engineering department. And I'll be working with my intern in describing human behavior in Wi-Fi networks. I'm really excited for this program. This is my first year. And I hope my intern will have fun. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Ryan Rodriguez, and I am a graduate student here at uh, UC Santa Cruz. Uh, I'll be starting my PhD this summer. Um, I work in the hybrid systems lab where we focus on uh, hybrid control 
uh, power systems and autonomous vehicles. Uh, my project this summer is smartphones for hybrid estimation and control in mobile robotics. And we'll be looking at how we can use uh, embedded systems and uh, distributed computing to uh, solve some interesting problems. Thank you. Could you please speak very close to the microphone? All the men speak very close to the microphone and a little bit louder, please. Like this? OK. Uh, good morning. My name is Daniel Alves. I'm a first year PhD student, not soccer player. I, my research is in networks for extreme environments, such as when communicating with another planet or in places that we don't have infra infrastructure, situations of <laughs> disaster relief, and so on. And I, it's my first time with SAP. And I hope it will be a good uh, experience to learn and, also, and to teach. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to UC Santa Cruz. Uh, my name is Katia Obraska. I'm a faculty in computer engineering. And uh, both Danielle and Larissa are PhD students in my lab. Um, I think this year is our fourth year in as a SIP uh, sponsoring lab. And uh, the experiences have been great. And that's why we've been coming back. Uh, so both uh, Larissa and Daniel, uh, this is their first year as, as mentors. But uh, as a lab, we've been participating in the program for the past three or four years. Um, so um, I'm actually, this year, uh, it's a very special year because not only we are uh, participating uh, in the program as sponsors, but I'm also a parent in SIP, so my daughter is going to be uh, participating in the program this year as an intern. So again, it's a very special year for me. And uh, I think it's going to be uh, not only a great experience for the interns, but also a great experience for our graduate students uh, to learn how to mentor and to um, do research with more junior researchers. So thank you very much for coming. And uh, again, I think uh, this is going to be a great year. Thank you. So our economics mentor isn't, couldn't make it to this kickoff event. So if we could go on to the next subject, please. I want to invite on the biggest subject this year, which is ecology and evolutionary biology. I used to be proud of astronomy being the biggest subject in SIP for many years. It was the only subject initially. But we've been completely taken over by those pesky ecology and evolutionary biologists. Um, last year. We had all of our mentors on stage at the same time. This year, because of the Hangout, we decided not to do that. Also, because we need a bigger stage. That's the other reason we didn't have everyone on stage at the same time. So um, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Chris. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, I'm a second year PhD student at Rita Meta's lab down at the Long Marine Lab. And my project is really to understand um, or I guess it's well documented that sea otters exhibit individual based diets. So you have like snail specialists, crab specialists, and um, urchin specialists. This project is to understand uh, what are the limitations of feeding ecology in individual otters and how this relates to, to how they acquire caloric income in individual otters and eventually leads to their basically fitness and survival in the population in Monterey Bay. Hi, I'm Juliette Oshiro. I'm a graduate student in EEV. And I study how plant blooming times respond to climate. So if you've been noticing, like, all the plants are growing earlier and blooming earlier, I study that. 
And um, I was a SIP, SIP mentor last year. And then before that, for like three summers, I was a, a mentor for another high school summer internship program. So clearly, I think this is a great way to spend the summer. Uh, hi, I'm Vikram Baliga, and uh, I'm basically a comparative biologist. And so one way of thinking about this is if you're looking at a group of closely related species, there's a problem in the sense that if you're to get data on these species, they're not really independent data because these species have common ancestors. And so there's this whole sort of influence of, of non-independence that we have to deal with. And so in our lab, what we do is we construct phylogenetic trees for four groups of species. And then we use these trees to inform the way that we conduct our statistical tests. And so that's basically what my SIP student's going to be helping me uh, do this summer. She's going to uh, basically assemble two family trees and then use those family trees to assess convergence within each of those, uh, those families. Um, and this is my second year doing SIP, uh, so I'm happy to be back and, and looking forward to a good summer. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Tony Kovac. I'm a PhD student. I'm in my third year now. You know, only a couple more years left and I'll be done. I'll have a doctorate and be all educated and stuff. Um, I'm, I'm doing this project on cows, birds, and West Nile virus. My, the lab that I'm in studies disease ecology. So generally, I just got back from my parents' house and they're always asking me, so what are you doing? When are you finished? And they always think that I'm doing vaccine development when I say disease ecology. And there's a different way of looking that, at that. That's studying ways of treating the symptoms of disease, whereas our lab is looking at why pathogens and diseases emerge across the landscape in general. So looking at the source of, of pathogens. And so I study West Nile virus. Um, the project we're going to be doing this summer is looking at um, what the mosquitoes feed on and how that's related to how much uh, pathogens are in the environment. Good morning. My name is Gina Contolini. I'm a second year graduate student um, in the PhD program. And my project is about um, contemporary or ongoing evolution in an intertidal predator. Uh, this is a snail that drills through mussel shells out in the rocky intertidal. And I'm really interested in studying how this snail may be evolving to ocean acidification along the west coast, since that affects the mussel's shell, possibly its thickness. Um, so it's sort of the broader picture of global climate change. I'm very excited to help um, train our next generation of scientists. And I haven't done SIP before, but I'm really looking forward to this summer. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ben Wasserman. I'm a first year PhD student. Um, I'm in Genus Lab, so I also study contemporary evolution. And the question I like to ask is, how does contemporary evolution in one species um, impact the structure and the function of the whole ecosystem. Uh, so this summer we'll, we'll be studying the adaptation of a small fish, the three-spined stickleback, to um, uh, predator, predator defense uh, traits that are energetically costly. And we'll ask the question, does the fact that fish evolving these traits um, require them to eat more or do something differently in the environment, and how does that uh, structure the zooplankton and the rest of the aquatic community? Thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie McElroy, um, and I'm a first-year master's student in the EEB program, and I'm based at the Long Marine Lab. Um, and what I'm going to be working on this summer and what I'm working on right now is um, uh, studying how uh, Salmon habitat use changes as we go through their environment, as their environment changes from the high mountains to the low ocean, um, and what that means for restoration so that we can help uh, restore an endangered species to the Central Valley. I have not yet done SIP, um, but I did a similar program when I was in high school, and I'm really looking forward to being on the other side. I'm Julie Herman and I am a first-year PhD student in the EEB department. What I'm interested in is essentially why Brussels sprouts taste bad. So in more scientific language, my interns are going to be working on the evolution of plant defenses in response to insect herbivores. And also, hopefully, they're going to be developing their own questions that they can answer using publicly available sequence data on the database GenBank.
Um, I have worked as an undergrad. I mentored students in a different high school program, and I also coached high school debate, and it's been some of the greatest experiences of my life. So I'm really excited to continue that trend here at Santa Cruz in my first year. So. Hi, I'm Sarah Skickney. Um, I am a fourth year PhD student, and I am looking at climate change and the impacts on the natural world. But instead of trying to predict what's going to happen in the future, I am instead looking at historic data from about 40, 35 years ago and comparing it to today to see what has already changed, specifically in how species are distributed across the landscape and as they shift their ranges to keep up with a changing climate. I'm looking at um, historic data from a Southern California desert ecosystem and with the SIP intern this summer we're going to be looking at what different features of species predict how they have already responded to climate change. And so I look forward to working with them on that. Hi, my name is Justine Smith and I'm working on, the, I'm part of the Santa Cruz Puma project here at UCSC. So we study the local mountain lion population that lives right in the mountains that you'll be driving over every day. And mostly my interests lie in how humans change the behavior of these top carnivores and how that alters other species in which they interact. And so um, for this summer, I'm really excited to work on SIP. I've been very involved in a lot of undergraduate mentorship programs, and I'm excited to extend that to the high school arena. Good morning. My name is Baldo Marinovich. I'm a faculty member with EEB, and I'm a researcher with the Institute of Marine Sciences. And my graduate student, Cynthia Carian, is the primary mentor for our project, but she's out at sea right now, getting pounded, I'm sure, collecting samples that will be being used in our uh, project this summer. We look at uh, zooplankton ecology in my lab, and we focus on krill, but we call it whale food, so we don't have to justify why we work on it. Um, and uh, we are interested in predicting how populations fluctuate, and one of the things you have to be able to do is measure the populations accurately, and that's problematic with krill because they're hard to catch, and they're patchy, and they're invasive. So the project that we're going to be uh, conducting this summer that's going to involve two uh, interns will be to use environmental sampling of eggs, krill eggs, and concurrently sampled with krill adults, and something in our knowledge of how the environment works to create a model that will allow us to hindcast adult abundance by the presence of eggs. It's something that's currently done with sardines and anchovies, another important forage species and krill are an important forage species in the environment here. So that's going to be the main focus of the project and it's going to be primarily mentored by my PhD student uh, Cynthia and we look forward, we've been with SIP for I think this is our fifth year and we've had a wonderful experience every year and we get some really amazing students so every year when it's SIP time I get very excited about getting some good productivity in the lab. Good morning. My name is Kate Ennis, and I'm a third year PhD student in environmental studies. Um, I mainly work on insects and their interactions and coffee agro ecosystems of um, tropical, seasonally dry tropical systems in southern Mexico, where pest control is a primary concern. So, my students this year are going to be helping me with some projects um, related to how seasonality affects predatory diets and specifically um, how rainfall affects predation rates and then how seasonal, um, seasonal effects on actual diet um, stable isotope, using stable isotopes we'll be looking at um, seasonal effects on the actual total diet. Um, I, this is my first year but I'm really looking forward to working with my interns. Thanks. And my name is Bronwyn Stanford. I'm also a third year PhD student in environmental studies. Um, and I do research in aquatic ecosystems. And specifically, I'm looking at the effect, um, sort of stream restoration um, effect, um, outcomes and how the condition of the surrounding land use affects that, and how we can design restoration projects to buffer against the, the surrounding land uses. And the project we'll be doing this summer is using a bunch of data I collected this spring. Uh, looking at aquatic insects and a bunch of other habitat features to try to understand the impact that the restoration projects are having. And yeah, I'm also I'm very excited to get to share share this project and um, get other get another um, student excited about aquatic systems. 
we could go to the next slide, please. Um, we're going to have the electrical engineering mentors uh, speak next. Um, please come on stage here. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. One of the things that I'll say for the for this audience as well as for the online audience is many of you have asked when we've reached out to you. Many of you have asked. We already have an undergraduate research program. How do we now take on a high school research program? And my answer to that is many of our labs have succeeded in doing this by having an undergraduate and a high school student paired up on the same research project. And I highly recommend that as a means of engagement. C come on, please. Uh, electrical engineering is, is next. Hi, my name is Patrick Ellis. I'm a PhD student in the EE department. Um, I work on self-calibration of antenna arrays. So um, a calibrated array is when we know the response of it. So if a, an electromagnetic uh, signal impinges on it, we know the response. We know what the electromagnetics are doing. However, they become uncalibrated. And this can happen for a variety of reasons. It, it could rain. A truck could drive by it. Um, the antennas could move. Somebody walks by with like a, a metal umbrella. I don't know, something like that. Um, but we look on at statistically estimating um, how these perturbations in the response happen. And we look to model that, too. So uh, yeah, this summer we're going to look at characterizing that. Good morning. Welcome to the SIP program 2015. Uh, my name is Nobi Kobayashi. I'm a professor in electrical engineering. My research group has been known as NECTAR. That stands for Nano Structured Energy Conversion Technology and Devices. We study peculiar behavior of quantum mechanical particles in a solid to advance the technologies required for energy in the future. So that's what we do. And uh, in, the, in the past couple of years, I have been uh, work. I had a I had an opportunity to work with the uh, great high school students, and sometimes they solve the problems. My graduate students even couldn't solve. So I'm very excited to have this opportunity again. I appreciate all the hard work Roger and his staff has done for me. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Jun Chai, and I work in the hybrid system lab uh, with Dr. San Felice in the CE department. And uh, my research focus is on the uh, control theories, uh, focusing on environment-based control. This is kind of uh, complicated to explain here, but in this summer, we're hoping the intern can help us improve the prototype and a program we de developed based on a control theory, uh, a control algorithm for a, uh, a DCAC inverter. And this control algorithm is developed for um, the use of power conversion in smart grids uh, that uses renewable energy as their energy source. And uh, uh, we're hoping through the SIP program, both us and the intern can gain valuable um, experiences over the summer. Uh, thank you. Hi, I'm David Friofles on this list. I work with Professor Kobayashi here in the Nectar Research Group. So I'm one of those grad students that needs high school students to figure out how to solve our problems. And I'm going to be working on a more specific area of our research, which is really the thin film surfaces, the interfaces between thin films for a variety of applications. Uh, I am expecting this summer to set up a water droplet contact angle measurement system, which gets very simple, but very valuable data about the cohesion and adhesion of certain novel materials for different applications. And the one that we're working on this summer is actually with the very first speaker who came up in astronomy, Dr. Drew Phillips, on making robust telescope mirrors and the coatings to protect silver so that the astronomers can gather all the photons they want. So that's our research, and I'm very excited to be working on all kinds of things, whatever the uh, SIP students are interested in with our, within our research. Okay, my name is Dan Killam. I'm a paleontologist, specifically an invertebrate paleontologist, so all of your distant relatives that don't have a backbone. And we are interested this summer in researching the shelled cephalopods, so relatives of the octopus, but these ones had an external shell. 
So we're going to look at the evolutionary history of the nautiloids using a review of the historical literature and do some statistics on their shell shape to try to figure out how, how they reacted to environmental changes over time and how that influences how, you know, their current morphology today. So looking forward to working with you. Hey folks, my name is Wilson. I'm a second year master's student in the ocean sciences department. So that means I'm an oceanographer. More specifically, I'm a paleo-oceanographer. So I use records like coral skeletons, marine sediment cores to reconstruct climate variability in the past. Here at UCSC, I focused on a project that's all about the marine nitrogen cycle in the East Equatorial Pacific. In the summer, I'll be working with my intern to reconstruct a climate record from the Central Tropical Pacific. This is an area that hasn't been sampled very much, so it's a pretty exciting project. We'll be using stable isotopes of nitrogen and carbon to look at questions like how nutrient utilization and productivity have changed in the past and have been forced by climate and have influenced climate. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Good. Okay, so my name is Costanza Rampini. I'm a PhD student in the Environmental Studies Department. Some of our students, our graduate students, were actually under the EB um, headliners, but there's more of us here. Uh, and I've been working for the past few years in northeast India looking at uh, the Brahmaputra River and how the fact that the Indian government is planning on building about 130 some dams in the state of Arunachal Pradesh is going to affect um, the flooding regime of the Brahmaputra River and particularly how it's going to affect the people, uh, riparian communities, so people living along the river in the state of Assam in northeast India. It's an area that's already highly vulnerable to floods with climate change, we're expecting more floods, more frequent, uh, worse floods. So I'm trying to understand and doing interviews, and I've been doing interviews with the local people to understand how these dams are affecting their capacity to deal with floods. And uh, last summer I worked with, also with a high school intern under the HSSI program. Haven't done the SIP program yet, but I'm excited. Uh, David and Talia are going to be working with me. So are you guys here? I hope so. Yay! I'll see you soon. Hi there, my name is Jeff Jenkins and I'm a fourth year uh, PhD candidate in environmental studies. I'm actually a geographer and so what I look at is how land conflict emerges uh, with uh, proposed mining and uh, energy development. Uh, right now I'm working in Wyoming looking at a proposed mine for rare earths, the things that go in your hybrid car or, or your smartphone. Uh, but this summer the research is going to kind of parallel that, uh, looking at how land conflict emerges with different amenities of the landscape, how people use uh, preserved areas. So uh, the internship will focus on looking at uh, how people use national monuments uh, around here and actually throughout the U.S. and uh, where they're coming from and the different uh, social perspectives on the ecosystem services provided by those national monuments. So I'm looking forward to the summer doing that. Hi there, my name is Graham Baird, I'm a PhD student in environmental studies and my work is primarily on biological control of soil diseases uh, mostly in agricultural systems. Uh, this summer we're going to be developing a tool using hyperspectral cameras to study plant reflectance and how that relates to disease uh, distribution across the landscape. So looking forward to it. Hi. Okay, my close enough? Good? Yeah, okay. I'm Jesse. Uh, I'm a third year uh, PhD student in MCD, and my research focuses on how blood, the blood develops in an embryo, and so what happens when that goes wrong. So kind of the big question is, why are some babies born with leukemia in their blood, and how can we help them out? And so I'm working with uh, one student, Catherine, and this is my second year in the SIP program as a mentor, and it's really great, so I'm excited to work with you. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm a second year graduate student in the Hartzog lab. And one aspect of biology that we study is information flow. And so before I have the proteins that allow me to enjoy this beautiful cup of coffee, I have to access the gene that makes the proteins to enjoy this beautiful cup of coffee and make that into an intermediate message called mRNA. 
And that's the aspect of biology that we study. Hi, my name is Susan. I am a second year graduate student in the Forsberg lab and we study blood stem cells. And my project this summer will be looking at some of the molecular factors that help aid in and re regulate the ability of blood stem cells to travel in and out of the bone marrow. Hey everyone, I'm Andrew Field. I am in the Hauser lab. I'm a grad student there. I work with uh, primate stem cells in order to model uh, neocortical development. In short, I make mini brains in a dish. Uh, I work, uh, I've had a uh, SIP intern last year. We did really great. We made a whole bunch of RNA-seq libraries and we hope to do more of the same this year. Thank you. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Jaime Hernandez. I'm a part of the Saltikov lab. Um, I'm a fourth year graduate student and um, yeah, so, so in the Saltikov lab we study how um, these metals cycle out in the environment and our main interest is on the microbes aspect. And currently in 2008 um, we just, uh, researchers discovered a new metabolism that allows these organisms to uh, cope and thrive utilizing this toxic metal in the environment. So that's what um, we want to do this, um, this summer in lab is to uh, be able to understand the molecular mechanisms of this uh, novel metabolism that potentially adds uh, again, complexity to uh, arsenic cycling in the environment. And I've heard great things about SIP mentors um, and the program, and so I'm excited just to be here. I've been mentoring um, undergraduates and other uh, community college students and never had a, the opportunity to mentor high school students, so looking forward to it. Hi, my name is Spencer Castro. Um, I work in the Cognitive Modeling Lab in the Psychology Department. And what I'm going to be studying over the summer is we're going to be looking at how attention is modulated by um, multitasking with mobile devices. So when you're staring at your cell phone, you look beyond it, what are you able to see? What are you able to pay attention to? Um, that's what I'm interested in. This is my first time with SIP. And uh, I'm excited to get to work with some high school students. We should have fun time. Hi, good morning. My name's Jessica Fernandez. And um, this summer, I'll be working with SIP interns on the creation of a mural project with Latina Latino children. And what our lab does is it looks at how art can be used as a tool to facilitate sense of belonging and psychological empowerment with children. I'm a PhD candidate, so this will be my final uh, summer at UCSC, so I'll be graduating pretty soon. And so I'm excited to be mentoring and working with SIP interns because it'll be my final experience. Um, so thank you very much. I look forward to meeting you. Good morning. My name is Sarah Goodman. I am a graduate student in the cognitive psychology area. I, most of my work focuses on uh, motivation and engagement and how that influences performance, specifically for cognitive type tasks. Um, and the summer project that my intern and I will be working on is looking at persistence and engagement in um, extracurricular activities among high school students, so kind of relevant. Um, I think we're, this is our department's first time in the SIP program, so we're really excited. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Barrett Anderson. I'm also in the Cognitive Modeling Lab, and uh, I am uh, looking at cognitive aspects of learning from games, and how games can change people, how that can help you overcome certain kinds of cognitive biases. And I'm really excited to uh, be working with the interns here. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Alexandra Merritt. This is my advisor, um, Dr. Christy Bird. Um, I am a, finishing up my first year as a graduate student. Uh, my research interests broadly center on the influence of race in academic uh, contexts. And so um, my uh, SIP interns this summer will have an opportunity to dabble in several projects dealing with different aspects of that. Um, I look forward to meeting uh, my interns and having a great summer with them. So, so, the research in, so the research in our lab looks generally at how 
students are, are interested in school and want to stay in school and how, they, how we can teach them better and it's specifically how their race and their culture and ethnicity influences their ability to do that and how they learn. And so we're working on a couple different projects as Alexandra said and so we're really excited to have the SIP interns here especially in psychology as a new department um, to get you excited about science and interested in doing research in the future. Thank you. So I'd like us to give all of the mentors a big round of applause, please. Thank you. I'm sorry, but we're running a little bit late. Um, you may have, if you've paid attention to the agenda, you'd notice that we've slipped behind even further. We started out late and we've slipped behind even further. And this is particularly a shout out to the online audience. Uh, please, yeah, please adjust your clocks uh, by, I think we're about 15 minutes behind compared to what's on the agenda. Um, this is the best reason to be late because we have more mentors on stage speaking with more passion and taking more time than we had budgeted. This is the best reason to be late, really. Um, I want to move on and say a few words about some precautions and some resources. Many of your students work in labs or will be working in labs. Many of your children will be working as SIP interns in labs. Many will be doing field work and then there will be many who won't be doing either of those things. They'll be working with astronomical data which, you know, while scary, is not at all dangerous. Uh, to your phys at least not to your physical well-being. Um, so there's a, we've done an elaborate set of, we've taken an elaborate set of steps. Actually all of the researchers, all of the PhD students and postdocs and faculty have to go through these elaborate set of steps to work in labs. So we figured that not only do the rules require that all minors go through this training, we think it's very valuable training for how to be safe in a lab and especially for an intern who's looking to do research in a lab, we think this is a valuable part of the process. Um, I do want to say that this is a really unique to, the, the precautions we're talking about are unique to lab and field work. Uh, there are many resources that UCSC will put out for its, um, for its SIP interns, not the least of which is access to our computer network and um, many other computational resources. I do want to emphasize that every subject you've heard about today has a computational basis, at least in the context of the SIP research uh, project that you saw represented. And there's, of course, office space that the students will be allocated. So they'll be treated like adult researchers when they come to this lab. And that comes with responsibility. That's why there's safety training. And it comes with privileges, things like resources. OK, let's move on to the next slide, please. For this segment, we figured we'd bring on three returning interns. So please queue up, guys. Um, Anjali, um, Tianlin, and Leah. I don't know where the other two are. I haven't seen the others. Oh, come on. OK, there you are. Um, I have you guys going in the order, Anjali, Tianlin, and then um, Leah. But we figured that. Uh, for you, our live audience, and also for our online audience, that um, really no one can say it better than the, than the people who've been in the trenches doing the hard work, but having fun doing this hard work. So, Anjali, I'm going to call upon you. Come on. And, um, oh, you want to go in a different order? All right. Go ahead. This is it. They make up their own minds. They don't listen to us, but that's, that's all right. Go ahead. Uh, but do, um, uh, do speak very close to the microphone and speak up. No, don't take it off, please. Because you want to be on camera, that's why. Oh, just kidding. Oh, wait, just kidding. You're going. All right. <laughs> okay, hi, I'm Leah. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm Leah. I am a rising senior, and this is going to be my third summer doing SIP. Um, in the previous years, as well as this year, I've been work in the, working in the astronomy and astrophysics department, studying dwarf elliptical galaxies and small clusters of stars in the Virgo cluster. 
Uh, one of the first things that I learned when I came to SIP was that astronomy is really so much more than stargazing. While astronomers do look at teles into telescopes, they also study things that are way too far away for us to see just by looking into the night sky. Uh, and by studying the light that objects very far away from us emit, we can actually determine a lot of things about these objects, like their chemical composition, their motion, and things like that. So I think that's really exciting. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of maximizing your SIP experience is that as interns, we're all responsible for our own learning. As Raja mentioned, um, unlike a school where there's a set curriculum of things that you need to have learned by the end of the summer, no one's telling us what we need to have gained by the time we finish SIP. And so I think one of the important things is to be curious and ask lots of questions. If your mentor has sent you a research paper and half of the words sound a little bit like gibberish, uh, make sure to ask them about that and they'll be more than happy to help you understand your project better. Or if you've read a paper and you're not sure how the conclusion reached in that paper connects to your project specifically, you can also have a conversation about that. Related to this, I would say take lots of notes I know for me in August, come final presentation day, it was really helpful to have a reference source to look back on to see which questions I was asking back in June, because I forgot a few of them. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to talk about was um, the embracing the uh, uncertainty that is sort of inherent to the research process. So oftentimes, if you're going to ask your mentor what the final conclusion of your project is today, chances are they're not going to have an answer for you. And it might even happen that the conclusion that you're expecting at the beginning of the summer changes a lot by what you actually find in the end of the summer. And that's OK. And your mentor doesn't really know where the project is going all the time. Sometimes something that you do one day becomes really relevant the next day, or it can become a little less relevant to your project, depending on the things that you find out. Um, in addition to that, it's also sometimes what you expect to learn is going to be different. So like, I'm in astronomy, and I didn't expect that I would be doing a lot of coding. But in fact, you know, in the last few years, I've been learning how to sort through arrays and how to make plots with Python and things like that. So really embrace any learning opportunity you have. And Tin Lin is now going to talk a little bit about what the process of experimentation looks like within the nebulous research process. Thank you. Oh, hey guys, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I'm Tim Lin. Uh, I'm going to be a rising senior as well, and I uh, this is my second year at SIP. Uh, and well, last year I did some, uh, a project about sea urchins and um, their genomes and how they uh, how the mutations uh, relate to their uh, their environment and also um, their the pathogens that cause those. Uh, mutations, and well, I didn't expect to be researching sea urchins at the beginning because um, I signed up for two different subject uh, projects. But uh, I can assure you, no matter what project you have, you're going to have a great experience, and you're going to learn so much, and you're going to be really excited about what you're being going to do research, do research on. Uh, and the first thing I'm going to be talking about is uh, experimenting, not like the lab experiment, because your mentors walk you through that, but uh, experimenting as in trying something new, trying something different, and stepping out of your comfort zone, because um, that's where you really grow and really achieve. Your, uh, and, well, sorry. Uh, Backing up. Okay, because uh, yeah, uh, stepping out of your comfort zone is what really gets you to do something new and to succeed. Uh, okay, <laughs> I guess that's what I'm doing right now, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess the second one, kind of ironic, is communication, because I'm sitting here and not quite great at communicating. But um, I guess. Try to communicate with your mentors as much as you can. Um, don't be afraid to bother them, but don't, I guess don't be too uh, pushy, yeah. Uh, but if you have questions, you should ask, um, ask your mentors or ask your fellow interns, because uh, 
because you won't always find the answer for yourself. And uh, communicating is a big part of science. It's um, it's necessary for science to be progressive, and it that yeah. <laughs> um, finally, I. What's the last? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Of, is to find your um, find a comfort, uh, find comfort in your while you're doing your research. Um, your lab isn't the only place that you're gonna be uh, conducting research. Maybe because um, because research um, a lot of it is done on the computer, so you could go to the library, go outside, um, really uh, experience the, um, the campus. And because it's not all just sitting in a lab and every day. It's not like school where you go on, there's a regiment, regime, or regime. Yeah, there's a regime. And uh, yeah, it's very open to your schedule. So you should find where you are comfortable, and uh, yeah, because that's where you grow. Yeah, I guess Anjali will continue and make it better. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, I'm Anjali. I'm a, also a rising senior at Evergreen Valley High School, and this is my second year at SIP. And last year, I did a biomedical engineering project where my partners and I worked to develop a program that would allow for doctors and health professionals to predict the prognosis for acute myeloid leukemia patients, given their protein and clinical data. And closer to the, okay, sorry. And this year, I'm doing an astrophysics project. It seems like a really weird jump. But um, that's something that you'll learn in SIP. Like, no matter what, research is very connected. Science will, you can go from one subject to another. And that's something that is really important. And so like Raja said, um, you're doing real research. And so one of the things that you will experience while you're doing your real research is getting stuck. It's bound to happen. Um, you'll be confused, you might not get the results that you want, and so that's something that shouldn't discourage you. You should not look forward to it, but if it happens, know that it's normal and know that you'll get past it and you'll still have a great project at the end of the 10 weeks. And to prevent getting stuck or when you are stuck, one of the best things to do is get help. Um, it's not always the best idea to just sit and think because many times you won't get the answer that you're looking for if you just sit there. And when I say get help, you can talk to your partners, you can talk to your mentor, but one of the things that I really learned last year was don't feel limited due to the subject that you're studying. Like I said, I did biology, but some of the most helpful advice and ideas I got from the astro mentors because they also knew what was happening and they knew the process of research, so they could give me helpful tips and it was really useful for me, so do get different perspectives because that'll really enhance your research experience. And the last thing I want to talk about is scheduling. Like Tian said, um, communication is really important, but you shouldn't only talk to your mentors when you have a problem or you're not sure how to do something. Also try to set up like weekly meetings or something like tentative at the beginning so that you also talk to them about the progress of your project and where you're going to go, not when you're confused because that'll help you get a better gauge of where you're going. And on behalf of all of us, if you have any questions, feel free to talk to us or ask us questions. We'll be happy to help because we want your experience to be at SIP to be just as great as ours was last year because we're all back here and we all want to have a great summer. Thank you. I just want to say that there are, I believe there are 12 returning SIP interns this summer. So please talk to the, the three who spoke, but there are nine others as well who are back in this program, a couple of them for, um, a couple of them for their third year maybe even. Okay, um, just to add to this advice, one of the things Leah touched upon is research is a reactive process. 
In life, you're taught to be proactive. You're supposed to plan 10 steps ahead. You're supposed to plan out your life 10 steps ahead of where you are. Research is not like that at all, because after you take that first step, you realize that steps 2 through 10 are not relevant anymore or might have to be changed. So it's a reactive process inherently. I have just a few additional bits of advice. Take ownership. It is really your project. They're the bit of the project that your mentor has asked you to do is yours. It's not your mentor's. It's embedded within your mentor's research project, but your piece is yours. And as with many things in life, what you put into it is what you will get out. Um, one of the hardest things for our students to do, for high school students to do in general, is understand the broader context of their research. I've been in enough presentations where I've seen opposite extremes of students not understanding the context. I've had students get up and say, we worked on cancer this summer, and it's now a solved problem. Um, they clearly haven't understood the context in that case. I've had students say, I beat my head against a brick wall, not, in, not quite in so many words, but I beat my head against a brick wall all summer, made no progress. I learned a lot, but made no progress. And then I found out that the mentor of that student was getting ready to write a journal article based on the student's work. He was going to include the student as a co-author. So again, in that opposite extreme, the student didn't understand the context of their research either. It's a very important but hard thing to understand. You're deep in your trench when you're doing your research, but it's important to be able to come out of that trench, to elevate, climb a tree, get on a hill, to see the whole battlefield. That Getting the context is very important. Research is inherently collaborative, so we emphasize teamwork a lot. And um, again, um, for the online audience, I do want to say that many of you are already engaging young people in research. Please consider taking on a high school student to work with the researchers you're already working with. I know there's a specific online question about undergraduate programs. I'll come to that in the Q&A. Uh, as students have said, uh, as Anjali and Tunlin said, Make efficient use of your mentor's time. Try to solve the problem first or among you as mentors, and then go to your mentor. Um, and most of all, act professionally. You're going to be you're treated like adult researchers, and we expect you to, um, to respect that as well. OK, moving on to the next slide, please. There are a few things that go on after the summer that are not formally a part of the SIP program. They happen beyond our final presentation. We feel our final presentation is very important. That's on August 15th. It's on a Saturday. We'll broadcast that to our online audience as well. We'll have three parallel science conferences at the end of our summer because our intern pool has grown so large that if we want to give each of them a um, fair amount of time to speak, we're going to have three parallel science conferences on Saturday, August 15th. While that signals the end of the program, that doesn't signal the end of the work for many of our mentors and their interns. Many of them, as I said, end up submitting papers to the Siemens and Intel competition. There are other competitions. There's, uh, I think there's at least one more in the fall. There's a couple in the spring. Siemens and Intel are the two big ones. Um, they, the Siemens competition deadline, if I remember correctly, is the end of September. So beyond the end of the program, you have another six weeks. The Intel competition is mid-November. The Intel has slightly more stringent guidelines as to who can or cannot submit. You have to be a senior in the fall to submit to Intel, and you have to submit as an only author on a paper. Please take those seriously. If your mentor wants, to write, wants you to write those papers, you know, the mentor will have to fill out some pretty hefty mentor paperwork, like recommendation forms, and you'll have to write a 20-page paper. I don't mean this lightly when I say writing one of those papers is an internship unto itself. It's a more valuable internship than the research you will be doing here because the skills you will learn in communicating a very complex subject to an audience that's not an expert in that field is a skill that translates to many more things in life than the skills you learn while doing your research itself. That's why I think it's very important. Explaining a complex thing to somebody else is the best way to learn it. And students invariably end up going back and repeating some of their analysis, repeating some of their lab work experiments, repeating some of their field work, 
because they find there are holes in their story as they start to tell it. And they have to go back and fill those holes. And you don't realize those holes are there till you have to tell your story. Very important. It actually deepens your understanding. It improves the research. Having to communicate does both of those things. Um, same thing goes for contributing abstracts, contributing to lead authored meeting abstracts, and contributing to journal papers. Those have a somewhat longer time scale, lag time. Uh, journal papers sometimes will take a couple of years beyond your internship to actually come out. So stay in touch with your mentor. Keep current contact information with your mentor in case he or she wants to include you when they write that paper. And mentors, you probably all know this, but students will often come to you and ask for letters of recommendation for that next summer internship or for college. That's um, something we have all do as mentors, and it's um, something that um, I'm sure we'll be happening a lot in the in post summer. Okay, I am about ready now to take questions, and I would actually like to start with questions of a more global nature first, and then move to questions of a nature that's specific to the Santa Cruz edition of the program. Now I know Emily, you had one question. Uh, for me from, from Matt. Um, please. Hello? Okay. OK. So the question is from Matt Malkin. OK. So the question says, we currently have a UCLA physics. It is, uh, we currently have a UCLA physics, a smaller RDU program that we have run successfully for years. The question is, how can we benefit from what is being done at Santa Cruz? I want to up our game, and maybe we can borrow or steal from SIF rather than reinvent the wheel. Yes. I so I, could you all hear the question? OK. So for the benefit of the online audience, the online audience can read this question, right, also. So I won't repeat the question. Uh, Matt Malkin is a dear friend. He's an astronomy colleague at UCLA. And he talks about an REU program. Can I please have a show of hands if you know what an REU program is? OK, I have a few hands going up almost entirely from mentors. OK, an REU program is Research Experience for Undergraduates. This is a program that many research institutions, many colleges and universities run over the summer, where undergraduates at one institution will go to a different institution over the summer to participate in this research experience for undergraduates. The goal is for the undergraduate to lead a project and write a journal article. Now, that work is not just for the three months of the summer. Typically, the undergraduate continues their work after they go back to their home institution. Or typically, they start the research even before they are formally part of the REU over the summer. And um, so UCLA has a successful REU program. And my response to Matt is, it is it would be excellent to take each REU student's project and pair that undergraduate up with one high school student. So they work together on the, on the project. Now, what are the benefits of this? The benefits to the undergraduate student are it they are no longer at the bottom of the food chain. This gives them a leadership opportunity that they wouldn't have otherwise had in the REU program. And it opens up this amazing research opportunity for the high school student. It's a complete win-win. You don't have to come up with a new research project. It emphasizes the importance of collaboration. It em emphasizes the importance of leadership. And I think this is a very natural way. And I think this is relevant for many of our global partners. It is relatively common for our global partners to engage undergraduates in real STEM research, it's relatively uncommon for our global partners to engage high school students in what I would call real STEM research. Many of our, many of our uh, partners are engaging high school students, but they're often learning the research methods, they're learning content in a particular field, and those are very important. They're important because they teach you how to swim before you're thrown into the deep end of the pool that SIP is. SIP should really be called gulp, because when you're thrown into that deep end of the pool, that's what you end up doing, is not sipping. Um, 
Uh, are there any other questions from the online audience? Otherwise, I will. Um, I'd love to answer questions from the group gathered here. Please, uh, all you would do is, if you could have the house lights up a little bit, please, Nina. It's right. The switch closest to you. Oh, that's great. Okay, uh, time to wake up, and um, please put up your hand, and, and Nina will. I love the fact that I'm no longer the only person in the spotlight. You're all on the in the spotlight. Any, any questions? Mentors, parents, interns. If not. I will start asking questions of you. That's my threat. OK, go ahead, please. Yeah, I have a question here. Um, and what I'll do is, after you ask the question, I'll repeat the question for our online audience. My question is just really simple. How many kids apply to this program? And uh, okay. where are they from? Excellent question. So the question is, how many, um, I'm going to trans transcribe your question a little bit. How many students applied to this program? She said kids. Um, and where are they from? Um, we had 459 students start applications. When they got to the essay bit, about half of them dropped out. Um, <laughs> about half of them. Now, it's this number of 459, it sounds very precise. It's, it's probably got some slop in it. As an astronomer, I know there's a big error bar there. Because a lot of students started an application and then forgot their password and started another application with some permutation of their name. I tried to catch that and remove those, but I wasn't completely successful because students are way more creative than one, one person actually started seven different applications. Um, they should have been disqualified right there, but we didn't. Um, so the number of students who completed applications is 260. We admitted 104. We have 104 students in our program. We admitted somewhat, a somewhat larger number because some students found other opportunities, including my own daughter. She was in the SIP program for two years, but this year she found greener pastures at Stanford. Um, but I don't know if that answers your question. But that answered part of, part of your question. You asked where they're from. We've had students from apply from all over the Bay Area, as you know. Um, we don't offer housing the first two weeks of the program. And we don't offer weekend housing any time during the summer. So what we say to our applicants is, if your home zip code is a certain number of miles, is greater than a certain number of miles, please tell us what you're going to do over the summer uh, in terms of local residential guardians. Um, so that limits the number of students who can apply from outside the immediate Bay Area. But having said that, this year we have a student from San Diego. We have a student from Boise. We have a student from Shanghai. We have a student from Princeton. We have a student from Riyadh. So uh, that's the number of students who are in the program. Um, many could not go through with the application because of the local residential guardian bit didn't work for them. But this is why it is exceedingly important for all research institutions to consider doing this. Um, what we end up doing informally is something we're trying to formalize. What we end up doing informally is we get, get I get questions from kids who are, say, in New York City or, you, or in the town of Austin. What I do is I say, if you don't have a local residential guardian, have you considered contacting so-and-so researcher who, whose lab is close to yours? And we're trying to do that in a more formal way now. It's saying now we're not only reaching out to the students, we're reaching out to the researchers all over the US, all over the world, to say, look, it's worked so well for us. We can be a template for how to get completely swamped by a high school program. Um, I'm not recommending that you all grow from a 3 to 100, but that's what we've done. And we have a very detailed workflow chart that Sue, Nina, and our friends at Google have helped us with. What they've done is they've said to Sue and Nina, let's sit down and talk about what it takes to run this program for one year. When do you, when do you start your outreach to different schools? When do you start talking to mentors about posting projects? So they've put this workflow chart, if I remember correctly, Sue and Nina cor correctly, but I think you guys put them into different colored buckets. There's things related to signing up for projects. There's things related to finances. There's things related to housing. And what we are saying to other research institutions is you may not do all of these things, at least not in your first year, but take the bits that you are going to do, use that part of our workflow chart, 
and use us as a template. That's that's why we're being so narcissistic today. That's why we are broadcasting. We're trying to broadcast all over the globe. Not because, not just because we're trying to say how great we are. We are great, but we're also trying to say you can be great too just by following what we've done. There's nothing special here in Santa Cruz. Our research is good. Our research is great. So is the research at many, many other institutions around the world. Our high school students are great, but so are high school students in many other places in the world. There's no magic in the water here. The redwoods are pretty, but that's about where the magic of Santa Cruz ends. There's nothing special in the water. Um, that's an excellent question, and I'm sorry I've gone on and on on my soapbox. I have a little soapbox here that you can't see. Um, any other questions, please? Please don't be shy. Questions? Yes, please. Hello. Uh, the number of your interns and mentors mentioned coding and statistical analysis as part of the project. And some of the, the students have probably had access to coding curricula or courses, and for those who not, I'm sure they'll learn some on site. But are there other resources on campus you could recommend for them to, for them to pursue the summer to pick up those skills? I'm going to repeat your question. The question was about coding and specifically learning to write computer programs. That seems to be a big part of SIP research. It is indeed a big part of SIP research. But the question was that while some students may have a lot of background in coding, is there a systematic way to, for students to come up to speed on some flavor of coding? And the answer is a definite yes. In the astronomy department for a few years now, We've had our astronomy students go through a Python boot camp. It's a, just for a few days. It's self-driven. And what we've considered doing this year is to expand that, not just in Python, but to go include Python and R, which are the two programs that seem to be most commonly used across the different disciplines represented in SIP. Now, it's not, it doesn't have to be just those two uh, programming languages. And I have to say that uh, I want to say a couple more things about computer programming because you raised a very, very good point. Um, computer programming, many people will tell you, is like learning a language. It's like learning a language for the first time. And once you learn a language for the first time, it's easier to learn that second or third or fourth language. Learning computer programming, I would say, is harder than learning a language. If I were to say to you, I go outdoor, you would understand what I've just said, even though my grammar might be incorrect. If you make any mistakes in your grammar when you're writing a line of computer code, your computer will do exactly what you asked it to do. It will go out door. It won't, it won't go out the door. Uh, it will do exactly what you tell it to. Computer programs are very unforgiving in terms of grammatical mistakes. And that's true for all computer programming languages. Learning this is very, very important. It's a, a important life skills. And I think there's one way I can point to specifically, and I want to say this to our global partners as well. One way, I want to, uh, one way in which our students recognize the importance of coding is the following. Our students, we've had 182 students in the program so far. We're going to get another 104. But if I just look at the statistics of the 182 who have already been through our program, 91 of them, exactly half of them, have already picked a college major, either because they're already in college or because they already know they're about to go to college and they know what their major is. The rest of them aren't in college yet or are in college but haven't picked a major. Half of them have picked a major, 91 out of 182. 55 of the 91, sorry, 51 of the 91 are going to major, not in the subject they studied at SIP, but they're going to major in computer science. Now. This is because whatever science they studied at SIP opened their eyes, as our interns said. They opened their eyes to the importance of computer coding, so much so that we've lost them from that field. They've gone into computer science. STEM, in our program, STEM is being used as a gateway drug to computer science. I hate to use that, <laughs> hate to use that analogy, but that's what it is. Now, this is one of the reasons, this is one of the reasons Google has decided to partner with us. Because Google is interested in young people learning computer science, and we seem to be doing an excellent job of channeling students into that field. Um, any other questions? Otherwise, I know we are running over. So I do want to make a, a couple of announcements while you're thinking about questions. If you're an intern, 
over here still, still haven't fallen asleep, still haven't given up on us. Um, at the end of this, please, I would suggest coming on to stage so that your mentors who are also in the audience can find you. And this would be a great way to connect, to think about what to do next today, next for the course of the summer. I see Sue standing up, which means I'm in trouble in some sort. Yeah. I was going to say that the mentors don't know who the interns are. are. Now know who their That's why I want the interns on stage. It doesn't do any good to have the mentors on stage again. I want the interns on stage. And this won't be a formal part of the broadcast, believe me. We'll turn off the broadcast as soon as I leave the microphone here. But I want you on stage. Just so your interns, uh, just so your mentors can find you. Freudian slip there. Just so your mentors can find you. Um, any other questions before we close this off? Last, going once, going twice. Thank you all. Thank you all. This is our. Uh, we're going to end our kickoff event here. And. Um, Stay tuned for an acronym called SPHERE. Stan we came up with this a week ago, so it's pretty fresh in our minds. It stands for STEM programs for high schoolers experiencing research early. <laughs> it's, the shape, it's the shape of the planet we live in. Okay. And um, it's the shape of the planet we live in, and that's who we're hoping will get involved in this network we're trying to create. OK, that's all I'd say. Thank you.